The planet's puppet masters almost surely have a plan. This clearly may be something near beyond the realm of man. And until you thoroughly tested every last post just True, Dr. Zayas. Well. Where would we be without THC? Cause we know they're lying to us, just don't know to what degree. Yeah, where would we be without THC? The highest side chat show. Red Car One Company. How's it going, higher side chatters? Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, and today is a hell of a show because who doesn't love Laird Scranton? He is the man when it comes to reconstructing cosmologies, comparing them across cultures, restoring ancient knowledge, and piecing the puzzle that is our past back together. Now, I know the workday is long and traffic is slow, but I only interject before the show to say that the new THC website is live. And with it, on the front page, is a new offer for a free week of THC+. If it works for Netflix, it's going to work for me, right? But you can go to thehiresidechats.com, sign up, and listen to any extended shows from the archives that you missed, as well as anything that's current, of course, any of the bonus content that I've done, and you can also check out the forums while you're there, too. But I wanted you to know up front, just in case you wanted to do that and then listen to this show with Laird, because it is a new thing, and he's really the perfect guest to dive into it with. We talked largely through the first hour about the Dogon tribe and their advanced, seemingly multidimensional teachers, and the second hour about the work of Velikovsky and other out-there theories about our solar system and space itself. So again, a free week trial is there for you, should you be interested, and with that, let's do the damn thing. Pack your glass and park your ass, people, because we're diving right into the deep end of the pool with the man himself, Laird Scranton. Play me in, Charlie. It's the Higher Side Chats Podcast, but you can call it THC. Always talking fringe ideas, digging up conspiracies. Stuff they don't want you to know, it's the stuff we want to see. That's life here on the higher side. It's the place for me. It's my favorite show where the guests are great and my mind gets blown. The higher side. Love the higher side. Raise your glass and toast to call with the host on the higher side chat show. All right, higher side chatters, we've seen enough from mainstream academia to know their interest lies not in the pursuit of knowledge wherever it leads, but rather in the preservation of pre-approved paradigms with a variety of so-called experts in place to thoroughly shut down any wild theories, healthy speculation, or God forbid actual evidence that suggests these narrow views must be widened. And whether we're discussing the advanced cosmology of an African tribe that rivals modern science, or complex mythologies from the past about our solar system that defy everything NASA says it knows, we find that by the grace of great alternative researchers, these official answers have more holes than a Dunkin' Donuts. Well, lucky for us today, we have just such an alternative researcher here with the amazing Laird Scranton in our midst. Laird is an independent software engineer who has been studying ancient myth, language, and cosmology for well over a decade and has written a plethora of great books, including The Science of the Dogon, Decoding the African Mystery Tradition, Point of Origin, Gobekli Tepe and the Spiritual Matrix of the World's Cosmologies, and The Velikovsky Heresies, Worlds in Collision, and Ancient Catastrophes Revisited, much of which we plan to get into today, so let's dive right into the deep end of the pool. Laird, my man, welcome to the higher side. Well, great, Greg. Thank you very much for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. You got it. This is a real pleasure, man. You do great work, and we plan to largely talk about the advanced knowledge of the Dogon tribe of Africa that was made popular by Robert Temple and a radically different model of our solar system's history that comes from Emmanuel Velikovsky's examination of ancient myths. And in both cases, we're dealing with situations where, if we look at the past, seems like they knew far more than we're led to believe, and in some cases might be closer to the truth than our so-called cutting-edge Western society. But let's start with the Dogon. As mentioned, they're an African tribe. 
And in honor of No Child Left Behind, tell us a little bit more about them for people who might be unfamiliar. <laughs> okay. The Dogen are a modern-day African tribe. We would call them a modern-day primitive tribe because they don't have access to high technology. They don't have telescopes. They don't have traditional equipment that we would consider to be necessary for Western-type science. They are a great entry point for the study of ancient cultures and ancient creation mysteries because their culture serves as kind of an umbrella, a crossroads for several different ancient traditions. They have ritual practices that are a lot like Judaism. Mm. They have cultural civic practices that are a lot like ancient Egypt. And they have a symbolic system of cosmology, a system of symbols and meanings and myths that is very similar to uh, ancient Buddhism. So when I realized this, uh, my, my entry point to the study of the Dogen was, like a lot of people, Robert Temple's book, which was called The Serious Mystery. And the first the intriguing aspect of the tribe was that they seemed to know some things about astronomy that they really shouldn't know without access to equipment. Mm. They understood that in the glare of the bright star of Sirius, there's a second star that, that orbits with the first star. It's a tiny dwarf star. And they knew not only of the existence of this star, which they shouldn't know without telescopes, but they also knew the correct orbital period for the two stars. They also knew some other facts that are some of which are still being verified right now by our astronomers. So that was sort of my entry point. And the more I learned about the tribe, the more interesting they became. Rightfully so. You know, Robert Temple suggested the Dogon had visitors or teachers from the Sirius star system that gave them this advanced information. Is this an area of departure for you or do you consider that a possibility? I am in agreement in, in a qualified way with that. And the counterbalance to that is Carl Sagan, whose response to Robert Temple was, well, clearly this African tribe has received information from a modern visitor who knew about science. What Sagan didn't do was he, if he had pursued it just a little bit further, he would have realized that the information the Dogen have is given using ancient Egyptian words that went out of use about 750 BC. Mm. So... The chances that a modern visitor would have brought this knowledge to the tribe using those words is, is pretty slim, at least from in my estimation. The Dogen do claim that their information is it comes out of an instructed tradition that was given to them in ancient times by somebody who knew a lot more about science than we did. The Dogen system of symbology is a close match for a Buddhist system. The Buddhists flatly say they got theirs from a non-human source. The Dogen say it was non-human, but go a step further and say, not only that, it started out as a non-material source, mm. which is an interesting point of view. From the Dogen perspective, the Dogen tradition is based on an archaic philosophy that describes universes as forming in pairs. They say that not uh, every material universe has a non-material twin. And so the Dogen perspective was that in some complicated way, what started out on the non-material side of this pairing ended up being an instructional influence for us back in ancient times. Wow. See, that's pretty amazing to me because up until recently when I really dug into this stuff, I'd always heard the Dogon story presented from the perspective that physical space aliens navigated here from the Sirius star system and this non-physical element isn't really brought up. But based on this description, it seems like we might be dealing with something more multidimensional or perhaps contact from a parallel spirit world. Uh, yes, again, in a complicated way. The Dogans say that their teachers were concerned about the potential bad effects that could happen to us from having prolonged contact with them. So that implies a physical presence you know, in a way that is going to be bad for us. The solution that the teachers supposedly came up with was to sequester students, a group of eight tribes members, at a remote location, teach those eight and send them back to teach everybody else and sort of put a limit on, on exposure. That sort of goes along with, I mean, there are reports in all sorts of other traditions, even in discussions of, you know, God appears on the mountain to Moses. Yeah. And there are all sorts of cautions around that about the Israelites not approaching too close to the mountain for fear of their own safety. So this is not like a really over-the-line perspective that they don't have necessarily. In trying to understand whether I should credit that point of view or not, as a researcher, I'm trying to anchor points of view that spawn interpretations. 
the uh, Dogen and the, the Buddhists have what in the modern day are matching symbolic systems of creation. The Buddhist system was documented by about 400 BC, and the Dogen system is given in words that went out of use by around 700 BC. Mm -hmm. So we know that they're both ancient. One's given in Sanskrit, the other's given in using what are essentially ancient Egyptian words, which are very different languages. So it's not likely that one learned it wholesale from the other. So the fact that they're a match in the modern day, that modern authorities on Buddhism are describing a system that's a match, a very close match for what the Dogen are describing in the modern day, means that both groups somehow managed to keep all the details of their system straight for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Now, as a researcher, I can look two ways at that question. I can say, well, I can take the point of view that, well, they kept all these other details straight, but when it came down to the question of who they got the system from, that they both somehow misremembered that point in matching ways with each other. Right. That they both imagined that they got it from a non-human source when they didn't. <laughs> or I can take the point of view that they kept that detail straight also, and that as a researcher, I have to give some credence to the possibility that there was some non-human involvement here. Right. And I think the latter is probably the fairest approach to all this, but it is a bit challenging for some people to get their heads around the idea of non-physical entities manifesting on the physical plane for whatever reason. But ancient texts and mythologies and religions, they are just full of various strange gods and visitations from angels and other creatures, and it seemed to be a lot more normalized. Perhaps there was a period of time where beings from the non-physical flip side of our reality crossed over much more easily, and maybe that connection is weakened somewhat, I don't know. But is that a possible explanation that you entertain? Actually, that is one of the possibilities that, that I explore in some upcoming books. You know, Critics of this point of view will say, well, look, if there really had been non-human involvement with humanity, why don't we have ancient other ancient cultures talking about this? Mm -hmm. And the response to that is, they're all talking about it, <laughs> every last one of them. The uh, Egyptians say, flatly say, they got their written language from gods who they didn't consider to be human. Hmm. Pretty much every culture all around the world, when they talk about ancient times, is describing things that don't fit into our paradigm of what you would expect from normal human contact. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that, that really isn't uh, an argument against the point for me. Also, the material that is being presented in this system of creation is uh, pretty advanced stuff. The Dogen priests say that their symbols describe how their tribal god created matter. And when I started researching the tribe and what they had to say, um, I could see that they had definitions of things like atoms and protons, electrons and neutrons, correct. And they even had a drawing to go with the electrons that looks like a typical electron orbit. Mm -hmm. So if they had those top two components right, what were the chances that this descending structure that they were describing might also be correctly described? And so I started educating myself about structure of matter, you know, reading Brian Greene and Stephen Hawking and popularizers of science, and realized that you could set the Dogen descriptions and their drawings side by side with descriptions from Hawking and Greene and their diagrams. And it's all the same stuff. It's an intuitively a match from really starting at waves, uh, you know, matter in the form of waves, all the way up to matter in the form of atoms, that they have, they have a reasonable perspective on each of the stages in between. Mm -hmm. But the Dogen talk about things that Brian Greene and Stephen Hawking don't talk about. They talk about how is it that a simple act of perception seems to be able to transform a wave into a particle hmm. or what is it that preceded the Big Bang and the formation of the universe? <laughs> and these are questions that, because the, the Buddhist and the Dogen systems are talking about these things, there's some reason to think that someone who really knew what they were talking about was involved. Right. Those are big questions about the origin of everything. And can you maybe go into, I mean, of course, you gave us some details about the cosmology, but maybe we can get into a little more and, and really how you reconstructed it a bit, because it seems fairly complex to do. It's a pretty complicated thing to work with. I have certain advantages. Having been a software designer, well, first of all, I have a degree in English, which gave me some perspectives into language. And I studied in, in school coming up to the ranks, sort of a couple of other foreign languages. I studied Spanish. I studied German. 
um, I converted to Judaism when I met my wife and studied some Hebrew. And so I had some perspectives that were linguistic and some perspectives that were symbolic from writing software. Hmm. When I would write a, a program for a business, one of the things I came to consider was, how is the guy who follows me five years from now going to figure out what this program is about? And there were certain techniques that I began to use so that whoever it was who followed me, maybe it was even going to be me five years later looking at my own program. How was I going to make it as easy as possible for them to figure out what I was talking about? You know, in math class, when they talk about variables in algebra, they train you to use X, Y, and Z as, as variables, which are not very informative. Mm -hmm. As a programmer, if you're writing a program that's supposed to process invoices for a business, you want the invoice number to be named something that sounds like it reflects the concept of an invoice number or the invoice amount to have a field name that reflects that meaning. Mm -hmm. Well, I could see that in the system that Dogen were talking about, that someone had used those same techniques. And that said to me that I'm looking at a design system. This is not an accidental system. Mm -hmm. So knowing that it was designed gives you, or at least coming at it from the perspective that it was designed, gives you sort of a head start on trying to figure things out. As time went on, my field of study is called comparative cosmology. Right. What that means is that I compare how different cultures understand the same symbol or the same myth or the same symbolic concept. And so through these comparisons, you gain ways of getting sort of three-dimensional information about a concept you don't necessarily know everything about at first. In my case, I have comparability of language between the Dogen language, the Dogen cosmological words, and the Egyptian words. So if the Dogen say that a certain word means something, I can go to an Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary and see that same meaning reflected with a similar pronunciation. There's another advantage to the way the system is put together in that words don't carry just one meaning, they carry multiple meanings. To try to explain that, in the ancient mindset, when they talk about processes of creation, they're really talking about three things simultaneously. They're talking about how the universe forms, how matter forms, and how biological reproduction happens. And they see those processes as being so fundamentally similar to each other that they use a single progression of symbols to simultaneously describe all three. Hmm. Now, what that means is that when we ask about the meaning of a symbol, we can't just say, what does a hemisphere represent? We have to say, what does a hemisphere represent if we're talking about biological reproduction? Well, in that case, it represents a womb. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about matter forming, it represents the expansion of mass. And so there's sort of parallel concepts here, but enough different perspectives on it that you can now have a, a cluster of meanings to compare to another language and see if the other language hits the same sets of meanings. Hmm. When they do that, you can argue that you have a firm correlation between two words that isn't a, a traditional linguistic correlation. It's a correlation based on cosmological symbolism. So that's one way of sorting this out is through comparison of language. Another way is through the comparison of how specific symbols are understood in different cultures. The Dogen say this shape represents something. I can go to Buddhism and see what they think that shape represents. Or I can go, I've now, my series of books has now touched on traditions in Africa, in Egypt, in India, in Tibet, China, Turkey. I have a book coming out in November that touches on Northern Scotland. And with each of these groups, you have a language that applies, and you have a tradition of myths and symbols that applies, that you have comparability back and forth. And so when you get three or four cultures agreeing on the meaning of a symbol, you're on pretty firm ground to say that that's what the symbol means. <laughs> There's another uh, perspective that is really hugely beneficial that it took me a while to catch on to. These concepts of creation precede written language historically. Written language doesn't appear until around 3000 B.C., and it's traditionally understood that these symbolic concepts go back much, much further than that. They go back may, maybe as far as 12,000 years, maybe mm. before that. So it looks as if what was an oral tradition that the Dogen preserved, that they don't have a written language, that this oral tradition, aspects of it were adopted to create the written languages. And so you have maybe 30 shapes that the Dogen describe that are matched 
by Egyptian glyph shapes that are used to write words, matched in the shape and matched in the meaning. Mm. And so I started exploring those, and I realized that Egyptian words can be read a different way than is traditionally understood. To give you an, an easy example for that, there's an Egyptian word for a week, like days of the week, mm -hmm. that's written with two glyphs. It's written with a sun glyph, which is a circle with a dot that can represent the concept of a day or it can represent the concept of the sun. And a, a second glyph that's an upside down U that's the Egyptian number 10. I looked at that word written with those two glyphs and I said, symbolically, this says to me 10 days. And so I went and I did some research and I discovered that the Egyptians, ancient Egyptians, had a 10-day week. Hmm. Now, I didn't know that before I saw the symbols of the word, but the symbols would have been enough if I had had a perspective on this. The symbols alone were enough to tell me that they had a 10-day week, to correctly tell me. Turns out that pretty much all of the ancient Egyptian words work that way, that if you know the right concept to substitute for the glyph, you create a little symbolic sentence out of the glyphs of the word that explains to you what the word means. Right on. Man. Now, you go to ancient China, and you can positively correlate their written language because they had an ancient word for a week that was written with a sun glyph and the number 10, and they also had a 10-day week. Hmm. Now, this is really interesting because, you know, at the risk of jumping all over the place here, I have heard you also talk about the idea of the old calendars and the 360 days in a year instead of 365. And maybe something might have changed in our solar system in within human history, which is so far off from what the mainstream would accept, that would account for these changes. Is that kind of your contention? Yeah, that will really apply more to when we talk about the Velikovsky book. Right. But the truth is that around 700 BC, you see cultures all over the world who supposedly they weren't having regular contact with each other, all shift from a 360-day calendar that they had had for thousands of years to a 365-day calendar, all at the same historical moment. Hmm. Now, to my way of thinking, if you can't point to an influence that caused them all to make that choice at that same moment, the likeliest thing is that they were responding to an actual physical change in the year. <laughs> wow, man, and the implications of that are pretty far out. Now, I have talked to other researchers who recognize this change in the calendar systems that are more conspiratorially minded, who talk about religious authorities and ancient power centers who made these changes to the calendar and official standards by force as a method of disrupting our connection to the earth or our natural rhythm and cycles, thus making us easier to control. A lot less epic explanation than a drastic change in the solar system but I guess I should ask you if you entertain that to any degree, or if the research does show that it was a physical change, how can we be sure? I think it looks to me like there was a physical change in the length of the year at that point in time. Hmm. And there are all sorts of other effects at 700 BC that argue that that might be true. For example, every total eclipse of the sun that happened since 709 BC, we have computer programs that can verify it to the place and the day. So we can calculate retrospectively when that eclipse should have happened. You know, we should be able to do that. If the motions of the moon and the sun and the earth are like clockwork, then we should be able to calculate backward and prove that an eclipse happened there that day. The problem is that we have all sorts of credible researchers reporting total eclipses of the sun prior to that time in all sorts of cultures. Not a single one of those reports can be verified mathematically. Mm-hmm. Man. Laird, I really love this kind of stuff, and it does get a bit over my head and a bit hard for me to reach conclusions about, but to play devil's advocate for that conspiratorial position I mentioned, or to invoke Occam's razor, couldn't it be more likely that there was some meddling with those records rather than a huge disruption to the solar system on a time-altering scale just a few thousand years ago? Well, we could say that, but the problem is that these same credible reporters who are saying there was an eclipse here on this day— those are the endpoints sort of that we have to hit when they establish historical timelines for things. The historians are routinely using those reports as validation for their historical perspectives. Mm. When we try to use those as validation for an astronomic perspective, we can't do it. Interesting. So they do check out to some degree then. Well, they, they do. I mean, they get hedged. 
you know, the person will say, well, it wasn't reported entirely accurately because it was cloudy that morning and they couldn't actually see it. Or it wasn't really at this city where they say it happened. It was really in the region of where this city was. Hmm. And I mean, there are ways of, of fudging the account to present it as being reasonable when it wasn't really. Of course. Now, across that same boundary of 709 BC, we have a sudden unexplained change in the rate at which plants absorb ions. Mm. And so radiometric dating, which is another tool that the you know, archaeologists try to use, doesn't work properly across that 709 BC boundary. Right on. We have major climate change that happened at that same moment, so dramatic enough that food products that were grown agriculturally in China for thousands of years suddenly couldn't be grown there anymore. Wow. We have evidence in the ice core records of major volcanic eruptive effects at that moment in the geological history for reasons they can't explain. Mm, so a lot of data so to suggest. something really, really big happened around 700 BC and big enough to theoretically justify a change in the length of the, the year of the planet. It mm. wouldn't take a whole lot of movement of or change in the, the motion of the Earth's orbit around the sun to extend the year by five days. Fair enough. And thanks for breaking that down. You do make a great case, and I'm more than open to that possibility. But to hop back to the Dogon, I've heard you discuss these ancient cosmologies and how they predate written language, and a point I really find interesting is that, based on your research, it seems like the cultures who developed written language have lost the most from these teachers or have fallen furthest from the original meaning and it does seem to be that way, but that sounds almost backwards, doesn't it? Yeah, from our perspective. My friend John Anthony West talks about the Church of Progress. Hmm. <laughs> and the Church of Progress, in his mind, is the mindset that imagines that there has been this linear increase in human ability and knowledge you know, since ancient times right. that just keeps getting better and better and better and better and better. But there's lots and lots of reason to think that that's not true. It hasn't been a linear process at all, that in certain ways our abilities have been declining. It's easy to imagine that the ancient Egyptians were more connected spiritually than we are to things that we are not really aware of. Hmm. So a lot of it depends on, on perspective. But the truth is that the cultures that, in my experience, the cultures that did the best job of keeping all of this information straight were the ones who didn't choose to write it down. They chose to pass it on through the symbolic system they had. Now, the system is... You might imagine that there's a long game of telephone being played and that meanings ought to change over time. But that that's not there. That this is a, a highly mnemonic system. To give you an example, when my wife were raising our kids and they were very young, we were considering going out to a county fair. But we thought, now what happens if we get separated from one of our children at the county fair before they can read and write or before they really know their own address and phone number? How are they going to ever get reconnected with us? if we got separated. Mm -hmm. So we decided to teach them to sing their address and their phone number to the tune of children's songs. Hmm. And so having done that, and even, even adult friends of ours who heard the song and hear, hear our address sung to the song, always remember our address. That From that point on, it's a very effective means of teaching information. Right. To give you another example, if I ask an average person, what they feel the symbolism of an owl is, many people will say they feel that an owl symbolizes knowledge. Mm -hmm. I point out to them that that symbolism is at least 5,000 years old. <laughs> that, that symbolism is so tenacious that somebody living today, 5,000 years later, who has no knowledge whatsoever of the, an ancient culture that might have assigned that symbolism, still knows the symbolism. Hmm. <laughs> That's amazing, man. So to talk about the teachers a little bit, what have you been able to put together about the mission of these teachers or the lesson plan and the rollout? I mean, there seems to be a lot there. There has to be some logistics to it, right? Absolutely, there are. And you can put together certain pieces of what had to have happened, some of the constraints that were on them at the time. Okay, it looks like there was an era of instruction that happened around 10,000 BC, which is just after the end of the last ice age. Mm -hmm. As an example, one of the first things, okay, if you imagine that there are several goals to this instructional effort, from a practical level, what they were trying to do was help us take a step up in terms of civilization. And 
to put that more practically, they were trying to move us from the role of hunter-gatherers to the role of farmers. Mm -hmm. And so one of the main things that was being taught was agriculture. Well, one of the prerequisites for agriculture is being able to tell time, being able to track seasons, being able to know, be able to predict when to plant and when to harvest and things like that. So one of the first exercises that was taught, and you see this in cultures all around the world, is a set of geometry that was used to align shrines to the cardinal points, to north, south, east, and west. What it involved was, now imagine whoever was teaching this didn't have access to tools. They were going to come in and teach a class with, you can't tell them, go down to your bookstore and buy <laughs> uh, measuring tools. So the geometry rests on an empty field and a stick. And the stick is planted vertically in the field. And then a line is measured that's twice as long as the height of the stick. Huh? A circle drawn around the stick and with using that as a radius. Then the two longest shadows of the day cast by the stick, the one in the morning and one at night, are marked at the point where the shadow crosses that circle that surrounds the stick. And those two points end up being endpoints for a, a line that is automatically takes an orientation of east and west hmm. because the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to track that line every day of the year, you would see it that it moves very slowly back and forth across the circle. At the equinoxes, it passes through the stick. And at the solstices, it, it's moved as far away from the stick as it's going to before it starts moving back. Hmm. So this figure, this geometry, gives visualization to the concept of a calendar. It also gives visualization to hours of the day. It's a sundial, basically. Yeah. Okay, so... Whoever was putting the system together realized that they had to have a unit of measure that people could measure out. The geometry works regardless of how big or how small you measure it. So all you really need is a, a relative unit of measure, not a precise one. So you don't need a standardized ruler with a you know, yardstick with three feet on it. You need some method of measuring that everybody can do. Mm -hmm. And so what they came up with was the concept of the qubit. And one definition of a cubit is it's the distance from the point of your elbow to the tip of your middle finger. Mm -hmm. Another definition is that it's the average pace or step of a person. So using just the tools they had at hand, you know, the measurements that a person's body can measure or they can measure with their body and a stick in an empty field, they were able to create this geometry that has purpose when it comes to agriculture. Damn. <laughs> I love it, man. But one criticism I have heard of this idea that a group of advanced beans or seeders of knowledge had this campaign to go around and bring up all these primitive groups of people is that the advancements and developments of these cultures are separated by hundreds or even thousands of years rather than being more in unison, as you might expect from that suggestion. Is that not true? That's a complicated question because in a lot of cases, we don't have a coherent set of records to be able to say that for certain. Mm -hmm. We don't know for certain what was happening at 10,000 B.C. And even in places like China, events that happened at 3,000 B.C. in China, we only know based on textual reports that were written down around 300 B.C. Mm. And so consequently, in China, there's all sorts of academic dispute about what did they mean when they said that and how could we demonstrate that they, what they meant when they said that because we have this huge gap in knowledge between when the thing happened and when it was written down. Right. So even though we only have reports in China from 300 BC of a system of agriculture called the Wellfield Plan, in China it's considered to be a theoretic plan, even though they have some examples of it actually being put to use. You go to the Dogon country in Africa, and that exact same system of agriculture had been in use for hundreds of thousands of years. It's the official basis of agriculture for the Dogon. Hmm. Well, is there a way to prove this idea maybe outside of what's been recorded, maybe by looking at the environment or the soil to try to find a genesis point that's the same across these cultures or any other way to further this case? Well, there are ways to get at it. My book, Point of Origin, argues that there's a very ancient site called Gobekli Tepe in yeah. Turkey. It's about a 12,000-year-old site. And the only evidence we have there is multiple sets of stone pillars set in circles with 
carved images of animals and some symbols on them that nobody knows what the symbols mean. Mm -hmm. And so in my book, Point of Origin, I use various facets of language to demonstrate what's likely to be true about this stuff. Now, this is a fundamental problem in this field of study that for someone who comes out of a college environment where you're expected to be able to prove things to five decimal points, mm -hmm. that's not the case in this field of study. In this field of study, the most you're likely to be able to do is demonstrate the likelihood that something is true. Mm -hmm. There really is no, very, it's very rare that you can actually prove that something is true. Right. So but what I try to do is I try to bring it down to as intuitive a statement or as intuitive a comparison as possible so that the person who looks at that comparison and sees one thing compared to the other understands simply by seeing it that it must be a match. Mm -hmm. That's what I did with the science. In arguing that the Dogen are talking about real science, we're talking about structure of matter, you have so many different stages of how it's created that when you lay that side by side with the science and you see intuitive matches all the way up to scale, it becomes unreasonable to say that it's not a match. Mm -hmm. And I thought that part was really fascinating. Like you talk about four level codes or guidelines that helped you unlock the answer, kind of like the earth, wind, fire, water being four stages of matter. That really was kind of mind blowing to me. Well, that'd be an interesting part of it. Now you understand that me being a software designer, as I'm looking at this system and trying to understand it, very often I would reach a stage where I'd say, gee, you know, if I had been the person putting this together, I would have thought to do this or that or the other thing. Like the idea of you know, creating symbols that, that were intuitively related to the thing they symbolized. Every time I reached one of those stages, I would discover, sure enough, whoever put the system together actually did the thing that I had wished that if I had been putting it together, I would have done for my own benefit. <laughs> <laughs> Almost to the point that it looks enough like my own work that it's sometimes confusing to me <laughs> to, to, be, to be looking at it. But the symbols get so complicated and the meanings for the symbols get complicated enough that it's hard to track. And so they give you these metaphors to be able to put things together. The simplest one, as you mentioned, is the four-stage metaphor of water, fire, wind, and earth. Now, from the perspective of creation of matter, Water represents the concept of waves. Fire is an act of perception. Wind represents vibration. And earth represents mass or matter. Mm -hmm. So now, as you're working with these systems, if you come across a reference that's explaining things in terms of water, you can automatically infer that they're talking about an effect that happens in the first quarter of this process. Hmm. There's another four-stage metaphor that's given in terms of the animal kingdom. It begins with insects, then it moves to fish, then to four-legged animals, then to birds. Well, you look at Egyptian deities who have animal heads, and you realize that Kepper, who is the Egyptian god who represents, from my perspective, the concept of non-existence coming into existence, that's a very early stage of creation, he has the head of a dung beetle, which is an insect. Hmm. When you talk about written language, which is a more sophisticated concept, it's something that metaphorically belongs at the last of the four stages of creation. The Egyptian god who's responsible for that has the head of a bird. <laughs> so using these metaphors, you, you're provided with a method of interpreting without even knowing roughly where the symbolism of a particular Egyptian deity falls based on what kind of animal head he has. Right. So this is super interesting because when we look at ancient cultures, you know, the mainstream considers them so primitive and that they didn't really know things. And uh, the reason they talk in these symbols and allegories is because they just didn't have the proper understanding. But the flip side of that could be that uh, if an advanced culture is trying to come around and teach a more primitive culture, these are the terms in which you teach, like, like we've been talking about. And so it's not about the limited understanding of people that are in these tribal situations, but it's more about how do you transmit these concepts to them in the best way for them to understand it. Like you might talk to a kid about where babies come from. It might be accurate, but you're probably not going to get into the nitty gritty details of sex. So there's kind of a little bit of a switch there when you think about why these cultures talk in such allegory. That's right. Also, you imagine that if we went someplace trying to teach a different culture about things that we understood, we would start out trying to teach them 
in the way that was most natural to us. Mm -hmm. Now, in order to understand the point I'm trying to get around to is there are performance shows with dolphins that happen like in Florida at SeaWorld, Ocean World, and places like that. And in some of these places, the trainers will allow the dolphins during the show to have a period of sort of a freestyling time where they decide for themselves what stunt they want to do or what, you know, what, what the next thing is they want to do for the entertainment of the audience. Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is that two dolphins performing together will leap into the air and then dive under the water. And in the time it takes them to flip around and come back out and leap out of the water again, they're on the same page with each other as to what stunt they're going to perform. Hmm. Now, some kind of communication is happening between the dolphins in that short amount of time to get them on the same page about that so the next stunt happens in sync. Yeah. <laughs> now, what they're doing is they're using sound, basically, to create an image underwater. And that one of them uses sound to create the image, the other one sees the image, and basically they're creating a symbol, and they're using that symbol to communicate with each other as to what they're going to do next. Wow. There's a perspective from which symbolic language might actually be a more sophisticated method of communication than our written languages, phonetic languages. Yeah, I can see that. And if, if you look at these Egyptian words where there's a phonetic aspect to them, but there's also a conceptual symbolic aspect to them, very quickly, someone who works with these words realizes that the power lies with the symbolism, not with the, the phonetics. <laughs> yeah. So what we may be seeing in ancient times is not a progression from a less sophisticated language to a more sophisticated language, but actually one from a more sophisticated language to a less sophisticated one. And so the cultures that never developed written language, from our perspective, were sustaining a more sophisticated system. Interesting. It's so backwards to the way a lot of people think, but it does make sense. Another thing I'm curious about is that I get why these teachers would school the Dogon on agriculture and the structure of reality, because these things are relevant to the Dogon situation. But why teach this African tribe about Sirius A and B? This gets to be complicated. <laughs> we have parallelism between three symbolic themes, at least three of them how the universe forms, how matter forms, and how biological reproduction happens. And so we know that biological reproduction happens when an egg forms. Part of something from a man comes together with something with a woman to create an egg. Mm -hmm. Well, similarly, we have a symbolic system that describes the universe as forming from a cosmogonic egg. And in the Dogen mindset, matter begins with something called the egg in a ball. It's a figure that looks like an Egyptian sunglass. So we have parallelism of the symbol of the egg up and down the scale. Mm -hmm. Well, this parallelism means that any structure they're describing for matter, they also are going to describe a correlate to. We have things happening in the microcosm and things happening in the macrocosm. To give you an example, the first permanent structure of matter that gets created according to the Dogen, this is a structure that exists at every point in space and time can be thought of as a little spiral, a little vortex, a little tiny, like a whirlpool. Mm -hmm. The correlate to that in the macrocosm, the one that is in our region of the universe that we have immediate access to if we want to know that it's there, is a spiraling birthplace of stars that's so faint, it emits such a faint amount of light that, that it's not obvious to us that it's even sitting there. It's called Barnard's Loop. And it's a spiral that centers on the belt stars of Orion. And that loop, that spiral, is the macrocosmic correlate to this microcosmic spiral the Dogen says exists. Hmm. Now, there's a similar effect happening with Sirius, that there's a structure that relates to matter that's very important, that is a conceptual correlate to something that's going on with the Sirius stars. Hmm. And so Sirius becomes important in the tradition because of that relationship between those two things. Trying to get the details of what it is is, you know, book's length worth of material to try to explain what it is. <laughs> but that's the easy answer is it's not, Sirius wasn't important to the Dogen because their teachers came from Sirius. It's because there's a symbolic relationship to Sirius that's very urgent. Okay, yeah. I mean, that makes total sense. And then I, I assume 
Robert Temple's interpretation. He just might have. Uh, I mean, he in, he in the book, it just seems like a suggestion rather than a, a conclusion. Well, Robert Temple, in fairness to him, he was writing in 1975, and there was no English language translation yet for most of the anthropological study on the Dogen. There was a section of it that had been translated that he includes in his book. But most of the details here, which are really gold for me in terms of understanding what the Dogen are talking about, he didn't have access to. Mm. So he was, to a certain extent, having to shoot in the dark a little bit in terms of figuring out what these things represented. It's also complicated because the way the, the esoteric tradition here, there's a tradition of priests teaching students or initiates. Mm -hmm. And that process requires the student to continue to ask pertinent questions to find out the actual truth of things. Mm -hmm. And there's a deliberate obfuscation, deliberate misrepresentation that happens in the early phases of that to misrepresent what the, a real figure is or a real meaning of a symbol is and so forth. For example, publicly, the Dogans say that their festival of Sirius happens every 60 years. But in practice, they make an excuse every 50 years to hold it again. Hmm. Now, your average person doesn't live long enough to realize there's deception happening here. Hmm. But the purpose of the deception is to hide the fact that that period of the celebration reflects the orbital period of the stars. It's a 50-year orbital period. Hmm. They're disguising an inner meaning of their tradition by misstating it. And so a lot of the stuff that even the anthropologists, the French anthropologists who studied the tribe, you get you know more than about five years before the end of their studies, and the things they're writing in articles are not really right on the money in terms of what the Dogen really think. Hmm. It's only only when they get down to the end of it, when the lead anthropologist was actually initiated as a Dogen tribes member, that you start getting down to the actual meanings of things. Hmm. Now that I love. And I wonder how they came up with such a system, because that has serious parallels to the way esoteric groups and secret societies operate and preserve their knowledge with these levels of initiation and understanding. That's right. That's true. Now, there are larger symbolic reasons for that. One of the things I'm constantly astounded with is every time I finish a book, I think I finally got to the bottom of <laughs> of the information here, the symbolism, whatever, that there's no level deeper than this. The Dogans say it's like peeling back skins of an onion. And every time you peel one back, there's another one there mm. that you didn't know was going to be there. Well, I'm continually astounded that things that I had no clue whatsoever had symbolic importance actually do. Mm. Things that were so large, choices that were so broad that I couldn't imagine they're like the esoteric tradition itself. There is symbolic meaning to the way that esoteric tradition works. It represents something. Yeah. Right on, man. Also, what can you tell us about serpent symbolism and its association with these teachers? Because that's a pretty interesting thread. Yes. Now, as we talk about the concept of there being two universes, universes forming in pairs, mm -hmm. the Dogen actually say that they know of seven pairs of universes. There are actually 14 universes. Hmm. And that is sort of a sibling relationship between a non-material and a material universe in every case. Now. From the perspective of the archaic philosophies that describe this stuff, the non-material universe has perfect knowledge, but an inability to act. The material universe has imperfect knowledge, but full ability to act. Now, one way of understanding why that might be true is we have to go back to Einstein. Einstein says that if you had a team of astronauts who were traveling much closer to the speed of light than we're traveling, that their time frame would change. Their time frame would get slower. Mm -hmm. And the time that it took them to, say, lift a cup of coffee and take a sip might be the same amount of time that it takes us to go through an entire day or an entire week. Mm -hmm. That there's a difference in time frame. Time slows down as acceleration increases or as mass increases. Right. So when you're talking about a non-material universe, a non-material universe that Einstein's outlook implies that the non-material universe exists in a time frame that's much, much more quick than ours is, much, much quicker than ours is. Mm -hmm. So quick that 
things essentially happen instantaneously. Things that we think of as taking time happen instantaneously. Imagine standing at the top of the Empire State Building with a camera and filming traffic going by. And then you bring your video back to your computer and you speed it up the video. It'll reach a point where things that begin as individual vehicles traveling along the street look like waves. Yeah. And the reason they look like waves isn't because they're waves. It's because they seem to be moving so quickly that they look like waves to someone who's not moving that quickly. <laughs> True. Well, that's, that's sort of what's happening here. And if you imagine that the non-material side exists in an infinitely quick time frame, there's no opportunity to do something. There's no moment to do something. There's, you don't have an interval of time long enough to actually accomplish something. Mm. Makes sense. So... So that's the outlook. Now, one of the symbols of the non-material side, because of that wave effect, is a serpent. A serpent moves in waves, in the form of waves. It does. Compare that. So the serpent becomes symbolic on one level of the energy of a non-material universe. Whereas the sun, like the Egyptian sun glyph, the glyph that represents the god Ra in Egypt, becomes a symbol of the material side. There are other symbols, too. Hmm. But the serpent symbolism and the connection to knowledge, the Garden of Eden, and so on, is all symbolic of this non-material side. Hmm. The idea is the non-material side can see us, we can't see them. The Dogen, one of their well-known practices is they carve wooden masks that they use for festivals and and drink dances, things like that. And the, the symbolism of this mask is the idea that the person behind the mask can see you, but you can't see the person behind the mask. Now, another aspect of this, the archaic philosophies that talk about these universes is that there are routine attempts being made from the non-material side to communicate to the material side. Yeah. But that are so hard for us to detect at the stage of perception that we're at that they are very subtle. They take the form of vivid images in dreams. Or synchronicities, or, perhaps. Synchronicities, yes. What look like coincidences to us. Or the odd behavior of animals. Or information is passed through clairvoyance. Yes. Or through things like the I Ching, where you're able to divine a meaning from, through a system of divination. Mm-hmm. Okay, and so part of what's going on in the viewpoint of the archaic philosophy is sort of like what I look at as a game of charades, where you have an opportunity to give one clue to somebody and trying to entice them into to saying a certain word or taking a certain action or whatever. That's kind of what I see going on between these two universes is ongoing routine attempts to induce an action that the non-material side can't take for itself based on a clue. Boom. Well said, man. I love that idea. And it also seems like magical rituals and consciousness altering in general were both a much bigger part of society in the distant past. And maybe there's a sort of use it or lose it factor in this connection between the worlds, which could explain why the link isn't as strong as it once was. But maybe those types of practices could relate to the source for all these teachers and cultures who had the magical rituals and who had really perfected the altering of their consciousness. Maybe they all tapped into a place where some non-human intelligence gave them the same type of information. It's a bit out there, but unseen forces do seem to have an effect in the world if you're paying attention. Now, what happens, what typically happens for people who are working in the field I'm working in, I talk to other researchers and other authors and so forth, is that you very quickly come to learn that there are things going on that we have a hard time explaining. <laughs> And sometimes these are very subtle things, and sometimes they're very, very overt things. Uh, when I was researching my first book, I didn't even know I was researching a book. I thought I was just keeping notes for myself of what I was learning and trying to keep them organized. But I was following Robert Temple's bibliography in his book, The Serious Mystery. And I reached a point where I realized there was a particular textbook I needed. But this was before you could go online and search for a, an out-of-print book. <laughs> All right. And so I had exhausted all the sources I knew about, all the local and regional sources for, for used books, and nobody had the book. And I had gone to new bookstores, and they couldn't get the book. I had even gone to the Vassar College Library, to their interlibrary loan service, to see if they could borrow the book so that I could look at it. And they couldn't get it for me. And I finally came back to my wife, Risa, one day, and I said, well, it looks like I'm not going to be able to get that book I need. So a few days later, a box turned up at, on our back doorstep. 
my wife had an aging cousin who lived in Queens, New York, in a small apartment. And every so often, he would get it in his head to divest himself of a bunch of random crap hmm. just to make some space in his apartment. And in this box, you know, you had things like, you know, Flags of Europe, a book on Flags of Europe, or a, a pamphlet from someplace he visited, or hot mitts for an oven, or just a random set of crap. But in <laughs> among this random set of crap was my book, Boom. the book I wanted. Damn. Then now, <laughs> the he had no idea I was, along. He had no idea I was interested in the subject, and when she asked him about it, he couldn't even remember actually having a copy of the book. Mm. Yeah. Now. That's a, a very tangible outcome that you can, you can say this is a coincidence. When I was being taught science in elementary school, I had a teacher who presented very much like Michael Rennie in The Day the Earth Stood Still. This is the sort of guy he was, a very inspirational sort of guy. And he said that at the point where you bump up against the, what looks like the third coincidence when you're studying something, that's the time when you need to consider whether there might be something else going on besides coincidence. Yeah. So in this in the study of this, you know, these mysteries, you're constantly bumping up against things that look like coincidences and and at some point you have to draw a line and say that's too many coincidences. I'm sorry, I don't believe that. I don't buy that. It's not credible to have 15 coincidences in a row explain why this is the way it is. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. That's amazing. I love that kind of stuff. And seeing as how you have such an interest in these cosmologies and the mindset of these types of cultures and how they got their information, have you considered going down a path of personal exploration with entheogens or ritual practices to try and maybe tap in a bit deeper to understand where they were coming from or what they might have been experiencing? That's one way to go about it. There are like uh, Kabbalist references that categorize different connections, different types of connections people seem to have to this esoteric information and how they get it. You know, there's the, the person who goes into a fainting spell and has an epileptic seizure mm -hmm. and comes out of it with knowledge about things they didn't have before. <laughs> or there's, you know, there are the people who are using the right psychotropic drug to get to it, or there are people who seem to learn about things in their sleep, or all sorts of different categories of mystics and how they seem to come across this information. The category I seem to fall into is one that's referred to as a pure mystic. This is a person who, just through the course of everyday life, seems to come up with insights that relate to cosmological studies as needed. Mm. And that's sort of the way it, it happens for me, is um, that in really interesting ways, just before I wrote the book Point of Origin, I thought I was researching a half a dozen different questions about language for different people I knew, and I thought they were unrelated questions. One morning, I solved all six questions within about an hour's time, and the resolution to those questions involved an Egyptian hieroglyphic word. All six words came from the same column of the same page of the Egyptian hieroglyphic dictionary, and the seventh word is the word that opened up the door for me for that book, Point of Origin. Wow. Man, the muse was helping you. Yeah, I mean, the, <laughs> you, when things like that happen, you sort of have to look at the process as being at least a, a facilitated one, if not, you know, whatever. Yeah. Anybody who's in this field of work has stories. I was at a conference last summer, a year ago. A woman in front of me, sitting in front of me as I was listening to a presentation, turned around during a quiet moment, and she said, asked if I would be willing to look at a symbol for her. And I told her, sure, I would be happy to. So during the break, she and her husband find me, and they bring me two photographs, two photographs of the same symbolic shape. One of them had appeared suddenly on the window of their house without explanation, and the second one had appeared on the windshield of their car. Same symbol. Hmm. And they were afraid that this was a bad sign or a bad omen. They wanted me to basically reassure them that it wasn't. Well, I could see that the shape was a shape that I recognized from my Dogen studies, but I, I wasn't aware of what the shape represented. And so I went back home after the conference and researched it and realized that the shape was pivotal. It was the entry point to a whole other half of a question I had been busy researching for a book that I had no idea even existed. Hmm. And when I told her that, initially it upset her even more to think that that was true. 
that how did she bring me a shape that I needed? <laughs> it, it seemed pretty bizarre to her. I said, look, you, you don't have to be upset by it. I said, imagine a friend, you know, a friend of yours is going to a party. You need to get a message to them. You might send up with a second friend who's going to the party. That's really all that's happened here from my perspective. Yeah. Sometimes a person will bring me information at a conference that I don't understand. But when I research it, I realize that it's an answer to a problem that somebody else at the conference has also brought me. Mm. And oh. so I end up sort of being the conduit between two people that I don't know. <laughs> Whoa, man, that is pretty wild. But I've heard so many people relay similar experiences. I think that's an area that mainstream materialists really are going to need to take a good hard look at. And you're one of the greats, man. You do some really deep work that I couldn't even begin to tackle, wouldn't know where to start. And it's really been a blast having you here to talk about it. Would you like to remind the good people about some of your previous work or where to further scratch the Scranton itch if they feel the need? Sure. Okay. My publisher is Inner Traditions. And so they have a website, innertraditions.com. And I have a page there, Laird Scranton page, author page, where my books are listed. They have a relationship with Simon & Schuster. And so I also have an author page on simonandschuster.com. Those are the entry point places to try to try to find out about my books. But the books are, are everywhere. You can find them on Amazon. You can find them at Barnes & Noble. Uh, a lot of bookstores will carry one or the other you know, some combination of the books in stock. There's a LairdScranton.com website that's a fan site, but the contact form reaches me if someone wants to send me a message. Or I'm easily found on Facebook. I joke not to mistake me for all the other Laird Scrantons on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> there aren't any others. Uh, I was just uh, in it, visited in Scotland, and I was trying to convince them that Laird was a title, not a name. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Very cool. So much respect for you, man. Thanks again for uh, you know entertaining my simple stoner questions. Uh, no, I appreciate it. your interview was was very interesting. You hit the, the high points of all this stuff. I really appreciate it. Right on, right on. Mission accomplished. Then, well, <laughs> uh, keep doing what you do out there. All right. Thank you very much. You got it. Sweet Jesus and hallelujah, people. I hope you liked that show. I actually love getting into the ancient stuff. There's just so many mysteries, and there's more than enough evidence to know the story doesn't fit with what we're taught in school, with what the history books show. There's a lot being covered up, and we really just don't know a goddamn thing. And I had sort of forgotten about the Dogon tribe until I had read Gordon White's Starships, where he uses the fact that the Dogon had this seemingly impossible information and some of it being quite random, as an example of communication with non-human logic. It gives us some strange pieces sometimes. It was also him who urged me to make room for a question about the CIA stealing Robert Temple's research. But, based on what Laird said about the Dogon's own descriptions of their teachers, they definitely didn't seem human, or all that physical, you know? And when Graham Hancock and I were talking about the Brotherhood of the Man Bag, or this little bag symbol that is in the hands of figures in Sumerian art, Mayan art, it's pretty widespread. Anyway, he talks about that being an allusion to these culture seeders, which he considers to be advanced humans from after a cataclysm. And what struck a chord with me about that perspective was that he brought up the idea that we might be due for a cataclysm, and what if such a thing happened today? What if a meteor hit, caused tsunamis a mile high, knocked out the grid? Imagine it gets pretty nuts, and maybe the surface is completely inhospitable for even 100 years. It doesn't have to be forever. Rockefeller only had prohibition for 10, and that's all it took for a whole country to forget alcohol was a fuel. But let's say 100 years or whatever. Just total devastation. Graham's point was... Who is this really going to affect? It would definitely destroy the Western world as we know it, but would it really affect a tribe like the Dogon? Assuming they could find proper shelter, they're not going to miss the Xboxes and the iPhones. These indigenous tribes aren't going to miss LA or New York or London or Japan. They don't even know these places exist now in a lot of cases. So the point is, imagine this devastation. You know, our shit is royally fucked up. And let's imagine a group of survivors from an area like New York City makes it to some tribe in the jungles of South America and starts trying to teach them about this advanced knowledge from their lost civilization. Could that have been what happened 12,800 years ago? When the flood happened, could remnants of Atlantis as a placeholder name have gone out 
to assess the damage of the world, met indigenous people, and brought them up to a new level with any information they had? It does seem possible, but with all the entheogen use and the emphasis on ritual spaces and just the widespread spirituality that they seem to have, it's also just as likely that they could have all tapped into the spiritual plane in the same way and gotten this information and these ideas for their cosmologies. You know, when I talked to Gordon about this, his big contention is that many of these cultures did not all rise up at the same time. They didn't all develop agriculture at the same time. So it's hard to say they were human beings from a previous round of civilization. And the spirit world theory is more likely because cultures could have accessed it at different times. And the cultures that seem to have the strongest spiritual and magical practices seem to be the most stable and the most complex. So there's that element. I was also just reading about this argument that the moon was brought into place by whatever caused the flood. That's a far out idea too, but unlikely because I doubt they had projectors back then. But as confusing as really getting a beat on the past can be, really understanding how the environment has changed, how humans have changed, how and why we built these amazing ritual spaces, it's almost impossible for me to get my head around really restoring the right context to the people of antiquity. It is amazing, though, and it's so fun to get into. And another thing I would say is I did go camping in the Grand Canyon a couple weeks ago, and you know these pictures where you can see like an entire arm of the Milky Way? I was actually far enough out there, and the sky was clear enough to actually see that for the first time. It's really nuts to think that ancient people saw the sky like that every night. I don't even know how they would focus on specific constellations in a sky that full. I mean, sure, we can point out the Big Dipper and Orion's Belt now, because that's really all you can see if you're near a big city, but it was a real amazing sight. Whether I was looking at billions of suns, millions of light years away, or some glitter stuck on the roof of our prison planet, I can't say, but it was sick. I guess what I'm trying to get at is treat yourself, you know, go camping at the Grand Canyon. Anybody can get three days away from the machine with a little planning, right? But anyway, big thanks to Laird. He brought some amazing stuff to the table. Check out his books. Let him know you like the show and it was worth his time to be here. Check out the new website at thehiresidechats.com. Get yourself a free week's trial of THC+. It would mean a whole lot to me. I'm trying to make this like a real professional kind of company show thing. And the new website and graphics are a step in the right direction, I think. And I'm so fortunate to be doing well with this. I know so many of our own guests are really struggling, so I'm not complaining at all, and I'm not going to pretend to be desperate, but I do try to put together a solid product for your education and your entertainment, and I keep that bar low at $5 a month just to make sure I got enough to keep doing what I want to do without stressing out the wallets of the listeners. I think it's a fair compromise. And stability is important, but I hate this part of every show I listen to. I'm sure you feel the same. So let's just knock it off and say, I've done my part. Your move, cosmology crafters and culture seeders. Your fucking move. Oh no, you see, the world isn't random, it's attached to puzzles. Strings control over everything. The nine to five is trying to steal ya. Now, don't that job seem silly? Hello, can you hear me? Or should I play back recordings from some spike agency? Wish we were younger. I'll be thankful when it's all exposed The vast conspiracy There's such a difference Between us And the damn
guys thanks for listening to the first hour of the higher side chats podcast with me greg carlwood if you don't know there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here generally we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about so if you enjoyed what you've heard from thc for free consider signing up at the higher side chats plus.com to get the second hour of the five shows i put together each month I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, 
I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the Plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle. Sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month, and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time? <laughs>